Now for today's program. Dr. Michael Berenbaum is a writer, lecturer, and teacher consulting the conceptual development of museums all over the world and the development of historical films. He is director of the Siggy Ziering Institute, exploring the ethical and religious implications of the Holocaust at the American Jewish University, where he is also a professor of Jewish studies. From 1998 to 1993, Dr. Berenbaum served as project director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, overseeing its creation, and was the first director of its research institute. He later served as president and CEO of the Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation, which took the testimony of 52,000 Holocaust survivors in 32 languages and 57 countries. His work in film as a historical consultant has won both Emmy and Academy Awards. Dr. Berenbaum is the author and editor of 22 books, scores of scholarly articles, and hundreds of journalistic pieces. He has been featured on Nightline, The Today Show, National Public Television, PBS, CNN, and Fox News. Dr. Michael Berlin has been an award-winning film and TV writer-producer for almost four decades, as well as Professor Emeritus of Screenwriting and Film. He founded the Orange County International Jewish Film Festival 32 years ago and moderates the screenings, and is the movie guy twice monthly on Pure Radio Jacks. Dr. Berlin received his PhD from Yeshiva University in Psychology, having taught psychology at Ramapo and Montclair Colleges, became the Dean of Academic Affairs at the College for Developmental Studies, and worked at Rikers Island Prison, Drug Aware Rehab, and in gerontology and psychiatric settings and hospice care, before becoming a full-time screenwriter. Please welcome Dr. Michael Berenbaum and Dr. Michael Berlin. Hello, Michael. Hello, Michael. <laughs> Good to see you again. It's tough after that introduction, but we'll give it a shot. Okay. <laughs> you know, I figured there, there's a long list of, of Holocaust films, and I figured one, we would sort of break it down and go through the decades and see how they've changed. But I have two questions I would like to pose to you first, maybe to set it up. One, the, the easier question, which is, what is a Holocaust film and do Jews need to be involved? I think of Sophie's Choice, who was not Jewish, but that's one question. And the second question is, you hear critics and, and film goers say all the time, oh no, not another Holocaust film. Haven't we seen enough of those? So let me put those two questions to you and then we'll go back and we'll look at specific films. Michael, let me answer the second question first. Um, there's a combination of what we call professionally Holocaust fatigue and Holocaust interest. Um, I can judge by the most severe critic I have, which is my own wife, who um, every time we see a film and I'm involved in, in many, he says, oh no, another Holocaust film. And then she says at the end of the film, gee, that story has to be told. And that is that there's a reason that Holocaust films both engender fatigue and also profound interest. You and I uh, face in life, life and death situations once or twice. And these people fought life and death situations uh, almost on a routine basis, day by day, hour by hour, escaping uh, death, escaping uh, danger, protecting, not being able to protect all of the, their own children, all of the issues involved. And every time you tell the story, it be, it tell a story, it becomes enormously complicated. Let me um, just give two simple examples. We concluded the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum by um, showing an endless film of survivors talking about fragments of memory because we felt they were the only one who lived in that world and in our world and they could make the transition. And each of those stories, fragments of stories was a, an entire story. Um, second example is um, a couple of decades ago, my friend Deborah Oppenheim and Michael Harris, whom you, Mike Harris, whom you know, made a uh, phenomenal film called Into the Arms of Strangers. Uh, about uh, the, the uh, kinder transport, the children who went on a, uh, who were sent from Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Austria to England for safety. And 
she based the film, they based the film on the child parent relationship. And then you had asked the question, when does a parent understand that they can't protect the child and the only way to protect the child is to give them away? What a and terrible when choice. does a child understand? And, and what they did is they portrayed it in a very profound way because they showed that the children who understood that their parents saved their lives also felt that their parents had abandoned them psychologically because they had severed, they had broken the parent-child relationship. Right. So the combination of that raises the most fundamental questions of life because each of us has once been a child and many of us have been parents and the question of how do you love your kid and how do you protect your kid and where do you deal with it? And when I, when I wrote on that, I said, it killed me twice. It killed me as the child I had once been and as the parent that I am now. Uh, and consequently it raises all of the ultimate issues. Now, let me answer your second question by saying that's complicated <laughs> because the question then becomes what's the Holocaust? To the average person, the Holocaust is everything from the rise of Nazism to the death camp, to the experience of death camps. Um, technically, Holocaust scholars believe that the Holocaust was the moment in which German policy changed from discrimination and persecution, uh, ultimately trying to lead to emigration, forced immigration into annihilation, what they called extermination. So if you took a scholarly approach as pain in the rear end scholars, we would say a Holocaust film deals with everything from the mobile killing units to the death camps to beyond and the like. If you take the average person, they think anything that deals with um, the rise of Nazism onward is a Holocaust film. Furthermore, there are Jewish exclusivists who believe the Holocaust only applies to Jews. And consequently, a fellow by the name of Richard Brownstein, who's uh, now publishing an entire uh, treatment of all Holocaust films, the Bible of Holocaust films, uh, will only deal with when the Jew is the primary victim and the primary focus, versus others who believe something like Sophie's Choice is also a Holocaust film because it deals with the apparatus of the Holocaust, meaning the death camp and the experience which was happened not only to Jews, but to other peoples as well. Long-winded answer, but a tough question. Okay, so, so it sort of sets it up. Let's see if maybe we can go decade by decade and see the tone of the films, the content and, and the impact per se. So I'm gonna start actually with the 40s and I'll name a couple. There are two that come to my mind in particular I'd like you to comment on, but any. One is Chaplin's The Great Dictator, 1940. One is Carol Reed, Night Train to Munich. And it was actually the first film to show a concentration camp. And this is 1940, um, The Mortal Storm, um, Lubitsch, To Be or Not To Be, Jack Benny, and Orson Welles, The Stranger. Um, the reason I, I wanted to start here is because, you know, there, there was a lot written and talked about, about many of the studios refused to deal with the issue, to show anything negative about Germany. They didn't want to lose that audience. They made an economic decision. And along comes Charlie Chaplin um, and makes The Great Dictator. Along comes Lubitsch and Jack Benny uh, and makes To Be or Not To Be. So let's start there in the 40s. The, the tone, by the way, maybe of the studios, you know, their reluctance and the films specifically. Well, let's, let's begin with Charlie Chaplin. Nobody wanted to make uh, The Great Dictator. And, um, and Charlie Chaplin financed the movie on his own. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Chaplin was strong enough, bold enough, powerful enough in the industry that he could afford to do it. And the other incredible thing is he instilled that value in his son because, you know, uh, I did the film with, um, um, uh, with uh, Danny Anker of Blessed Memory, uh, Imaginary Witness, Hollywood and the Holocaust. And we used a lot of material from Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator. When we approached his son, he said, my father never wanted to make a penny off this movie. 
I will give you the rights to use the movie for one dollar. And believe me, we used a hell of a lot more than one dollar's worth of Charlie Chaplin. I also have in mind, uh, I once interviewed Mel Brooks on the Holocaust and humor. And I said to Mel Brooks, I asked him the question, um, how do you deal with the Holocaust and humor? And he said, I've never made a joke about the Holocaust, but about Hitler, let's go. And Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator was all about tackling uh, Adolf Hitler with the ultimate um, weapon that Charlie Chaplin had, uniquely had, which was humor. And he ripped the floor up with him. There's a, a ballet scene in <laughs> with the Charlie globe. Chaplin has the whole world in his hand in a, in a sort of uh, balloon and pop goes the balloon. This is 1940. This is before the concentration camps begin. Uh, before, not before the concentration, before the killing begins in the concentration camps. He's doing that. There's also one other thing with Chaplin, which, um, you know, Hitler represented, quotation marks, the master race. So you would expect Hitler to be a six foot two, 240 pound, blonde haired, blue eyed Aryan beast. Hitler was exactly identical to the Jewish barber. And that in and of itself is wiping the floor up with Adolf Hitler in the presumption and can be taken, what can be presumed for that. So Chaplin had a roaring time with that. The studios tried to protect their business for as long as possible. The one exception on that, there were actually two different exceptions. Number one was, um, was uh, the Warner Brothers that were more political and tougher and Jack Warner was viciously and vigorously and properly anti-fascist. And the other was Carl Lemley, who uh, was head of Universal Studios. Uh, Warner was obviously the head of Warner Brothers, head of Universal Studios who rescued all of the people from his hometown. So he knew exactly what was there. But in the Mortal Storm, for example, they took out the role of, um, uh, the, they, they couldn't get the actor to use his name on playing Adolf Hitler because he was afraid of his own safety. And there were any number of people who refused to have their name associated uh, with that. Uh, they also used humor. And they also, uh, uh, again, um, it presumes, the mortal storm presumes, it's not dealing with the Holocaust. Mortal storm is dealing with, um, with fascism with an authoritarian government, with um, all of the attack um, on uh, freedoms and also the one Jewish character. But notice in the moral storm, the word Jew is never mentioned. Right. Greenberg with the big nose and all of that. <laughs> right. Like, so it's a different, it's a different story. And the forties is uh, intriguing in that because um, the forties, uh, again, you have to distinguish between those films made before the war, before America got into the war, when we were isolationists, and then those films made in the war, when we were trying to show the American way versus the Nazi way, and nothing, you know, uh, to portray who we are and, and what we are. And again, you have um, uh, some major um, actors who are uh, in there and um, understand the power of film to influence the American public. Yeah. That's why one of the reasons I love the original to be or not to be. I love Jack Benny and Carol Lombard and absolutely, you know, the, the Polish theater company. One, one other aside, you, you mentioned something in passing and I was thinking about Casablanca. I didn't mention it because I don't think of it in particular as a Holocaust film, but in terms of the, the background to the film, you remember the great scene when they, they're in, the, in Rick's and they stand up and they sing La Marseillaise up against the Germans singing their song. And, and one of the most interesting things is, is that most of the actors in that scene had escaped from Nazi Germany. Um, and if you watch their faces when they're singing La Marseillaise, you don't even have to fake it. You don't even have to act. You know, there's they didn't have power to, to that. But let, let's also say this. Michael, um, 
one of the groups that escaped were filmmakers and we realized uh, something very interesting. I, when I teach the Holocaust, I say that uh, those with a portable profession were um, more ready to flee than those without a portable profession. Right. So, for example, musicians and architects have a portable profession. Writers do not. Lawyers are trained in a legal system. Uh, doctors are not. Ironically, nurses are more employable because they have less licensing requirements. But the interesting thing is that we found, given the contribution of American, uh, of uh, European uh, filmmakers, producers, directors, writers and musicians, people who wrote for, for it, given their contribution, their enormous contribution to American film, we have to say that filmmaking was a portable profession. Yeah. And the filmmakers, the actors who came here made the transition very rapidly and Hollywood was open to them. In a Billy very- Wilder being one of them. I yeah. didn't hear who you mentioned. Billy Wilder. Billy Wilder being 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 uh, being open to them all the way through. So um, Hollywood was very open to these men and women. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay, let let's talk the fifties. Um, you know, it's interesting. Sort of in America, the the focus shifts to the Cold War, the Russians. You know, we have other concerns, so to speak, um, and it's it's not a particularly a great decade for films. I, I'll mention three that come to mind. Uh, and one actually is the TV piece. One is The Juggler, um, and that's a Kurt Douglas movie. And that's a, a survivor who ultimately goes to Israel, but can't ever let go of the past. It's an interesting movie in the early 50s. The Diary let's, of let's, let's stop there for, for just one moment. Sure. Survivors were not originally called survivors. They were called refugees, sometimes effugees. And in America, they were called Grina. And in Israel, they were called Sabonikim, soaps under the myth that uh, the Nazis made soaps of, of Jews. They were considered, and the juggler reflects it, they were considered, quotation marks, damaged goods. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the, par ex the, the film par excellence in that in America, and one of our uh, people asked about it already was the pawnbroker. The pawnbroker, right. And the pawnbroker showed a man who was no longer capable of feeling, almost bereft of feeling, who, um, and you had a, a, a dialogue between two types of survivor. The old man who had survived the father of, of, of Saul Nazman's uh, lover uh, uh, said, you survived death, God damn it, live, live, live. What are you worried about? And you're not, and, and his challenge to Saul Nazman, who's the survivor there is, you're barely alive. You don't feel, you've, you've, you've closed yourself up dramatically. And we even see that in the final <laughs> scene, when, and... when he has, he has two, two moments of the final scene. One is one I taught Rod Steiger's um, uh, daughter. And I asked him about that final scene. He said it was his greatest moment of acting because what he did was when he saw his, um, his um, associate, his, his, his employee uh, killed and on the ground, um, he started to scream and then uh, he had a, a moment in which he said, let me put in a silent scream and make the audience scream for me. So he couldn't even scream. And then what does he do? His final scene is he puts his hand right through a right through a, a um, uh, what do you call it the mail the the uh, right the, the the nail that's sticking up that you put the papers through <laughs> and you put the, the put the papers through and, and right. you see his pain you see his anguish you see the whole thing and and again he expresses it all in his face so the juggler represents the notion of those who came out were damaged goods. And ironically, we'll see that they tried to portray it a little bit differently in um, what was also popular in the 50s, which was the great This Is Your Life show with a Holocaust survivor, in which it's told as a love story. Um, she went through all of that. She came to America. She met her husband. They live happily ever after. She's reunited 
with her brother and she tells the story all the way through and it's a great uh, American triumph where Hollywood loves that they live happily ever after. Right. So the juggler represents a moment before survivors are called survivors, certainly before their witnesses when they're considered damaged goods. And lest people criticize me, I am doing that descriptively. I'm not describing, uh, uh, descriptively of the era. I'm not describing my views on that. Gotcha. That's very clear. Like, Thank you. like to be criticized for many things. That's not one of them. Let, let's talk the end of the decade. That One, the diary of Anne Frank. And two, Playhouse 90, one of the great television shows, the original Judgment at Nuremberg, uh, and the irony of the advertising for that show. Well, Playhouse 90 was uh, the Nure Judgment at Nuremberg. We saw it uh, first on the screen. And there's a hidden moment in that it was um, sponsored, or dare we say, missponsored by the American Gas Company. And they discovered um, on the night before they were going to shoot it, they discovered something quite remarkable, which is that they were people were killed in gas chambers. And the American Gas Company then stepped in. And remember, this was a time when sponsors had dramatic control of the program. So they bleeped out the word gas. And that ends up being the one word everybody heard <laughs> right. that night. Like, but, but Judgment at Nuremberg is interesting because it had two combinations. Um, it had the film within the film or the film within the play, which is that at the Judgment at Nuremberg, which was a trial of documents. Right. I have in my library over here uh, two shelf loads of the documents that were produced by by um, by Nuremberg. And wasn't this also a trial of judges and lawyers? It was a trial of judges and lawyers and a trial of document. But there was one moment in the trial when it became deeply and profoundly emotional. And that's the moment at which they showed the film that was taken in the camps. And remember, the film that was primarily taken in camps was taken in Western camps, which were not the killing centers taken by American uh, film crews. By the way, some of the great filmmakers of that generation, uh, Frank Capra, uh, uh, George Stephen, all volunteered to go into the army and to use the power of film. Uh, remember, World War II was a war that everybody was in, and they felt that uh, the entire world was at stake in World War in World War II, so there was no shirking, no ambiguity. It was anything but as a forgotten, a forgotten war, and consequently, um, uh, Judgment at Nuremberg shows the film within the film, which is the emotional high point. The other thing that it does, and Maximilian Schell plays it to incredible uh, with incredible power is it universalizes guilt. It says, didn't Winston Churchill admire some of what Hitler uh, accomplished? What about the churches and their silence and their collaboration? What about the American administration and Jim Crow and segregation? So uh, he tries to both particularize and uh, to universalize the guilt and say, everybody does some bad things. These guys did their own thing. But it's the moment of the film within the film that makes it all powerful. Uh, the other film we're talking about, which um, uh, is, is The Diary of Anne Frank. And this is, um, interestingly enough, probably the most impactful book in um, one of the two books that everybody reads who learns about the Holocaust. It's the great coming of age story of a young um, teenage uh, girl. Uh, I had many years ago, the enormous privilege of traveling the country with Meep Geese. Meep Geese was the woman who provided for the Frank family. And I saw the impact of the diary in a very particular way, which is everybody wanted to touch her, hug her, and sort of enter all of her private space because you had women from 16 to 80, who had played her. 
And to play somebody in a play, you really believe that you know them. Right. And you are them for to play it effectively. And she said, that happens to me all over the world. But the Diary of Anne Frank, uh, again, it really ends as the Holocaust begins for Anne Frank. Because the Germans capture, uh, the, the Nazis capture her. They take her off to Westerbrook. From Westerbrook, she goes to Auschwitz. From Auschwitz to Bergen-Belsen. But she ends up with the line, above all, I believe that man is good as heart, good at heart. And I cynically, the bastard that I am, say man may, may be good at heart, but the Holocaust is no evidence of that. And uh, I also then write on that, hope dies uh, at Auschwitz, so too innocence. But part of what makes the Anne Frank story that, that powerful story is precisely the audience knows what happened to her, but here you have innocence personified and her coming of age. It's a, a little bit of a sanitized version. They take out the tension she had with her mother. They take out all the description uh, that you have in the diary of her menstruation and coming of age as a, as, as, as a woman. They take out a lot of the Jewish stuff because in the 50s, you couldn't be too Jewish, right. T-O-O -O Jewish. Uh, when I went to yeshiva, we were told that a yarmulke was an indoor garment. You don't wear it. Outside. Out, outdoors. And uh, only with Black Pride did Jews then develop the sense of we too can be proud of our minority history. And somebody had written at that period, some are born blind, some are born lame, some are born Jewish. Uh, and yeah. Philip Roth, remember, has that great um, uh, short story, Eli the Fanatic who are the most uncomfortable people with the newfound religiosity of one of their neighbors, not the Gentiles, but the Jews. So Anne Frank uh, narrows the Jewishness of the whole thing. The other part of it, would, and celebrates Hanukkah, which is the festival of freedom. Uh, and the other thing that's intriguing in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, when they remake the Diary of Anne Frank, they take Anne Frank to Vesterbrook, Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, where she tragically died but a month before liberation. liberation. You know, I, I want to add two, two things very quickly to what you said. One of them was George Stevens, one of the people you mentioned, ultimately directs the diary of Anne Frank. He had seen it firsthand, um, you know, as a war photographer and a, a filmmaker during the war, and he directed it. The other thing was, I taught college back in New Jersey um, in the 70s, and Jersey banned from their school libraries seven books. One of those seven books was the, the Diary of Anne Frank. Why? Because it dealt with her menstrual cycle. It's interesting. The 13 million people who were dying outside that window, that didn't bother them. But somehow, you know, the fact that she talked about that, that was to be banned. Uh, in junior high school and high schools. Uh, it's unbelievable to me. I, you know, it's like you can't even make those things up, what goes into that kind of thinking. Um, anyway, let's, let's sort yeah, of we, move. Go ahead. I, I'm only commenting on, because I'm, I'm dealing with, um, we had a program that was Zoom bombed. <laughs> and in the Zoom bomb, they say gas the Jews and then they say, F the Jews. The, um, we're thinking of Zoom, using it as an example of anti-Semitism in the modern world. And the museum we're working with has no problem with the words gas to Jews, but F the Jews is deeply <laughs> and profoundly problematic. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you see the sensitivities of, uh, and my argument is, why isn't gas the Jews far more obscene than F the Jews? And I'm you know, being, uh, uh, I, I presume our audience will know and moment will not censor us if we said the F word, but let's be polite. This is why uh, Mel Brooks had a field day with this, but let, let's come to the 60s. Um, I, and I wanna actually, it's funny, we mentioned the pawnbroker, we mentioned the original Judgment at Nuremberg and then the film comes out. And also at the end of a decade, the producers comes out. 
let's talk to producers for a minute because you know the obvious question about you know well the the question the question is is the producers a holocaust film or is it a uh, an anti-nazi film in its own in its own particular way mm -hmm. it, it it's based on a premise that that somehow um anybody who um uh, uh had a song at springtime for Hitler in paradise would have a total flop on Broadway. And then everybody enjoyed it as, as satire <laughs> and the guy couldn't, couldn't lose money on the film and therefore couldn't get the hell, you know, worse so comes to worse. Prison, I, got, that's right. I got bad news for you. You're a success in your financial, <laughs> your, your financial uh, wizard, but it's based on the premise in one sense, the Holocaust is the backstory or Nazism is the backstory. This is evil. Therefore, <laughs> anything we do is, is presumed that, but it doesn't quite deal with that. And again, it's, it's Mel Brooks's desire to, um, and remember Mel Brooks did it again and again. He did it uh, up until recently with Curb Your Enthusiasm. The, uh, Curb, Your, Curb Your Enthusiasm and, and uh, the scenes in which Larry David was going to going to play uh, Max Bialystok. <laughs> uh, uh, so it, the idea of making fun of Hitler, one of the ways you gain control is with humor. We were talking before my my literally favorite Holocaust joke. And before the audience uh, clobbers me, let me explain something to you. Um, I look at the way in which humor was used by the victims to gain some control over the circumstances. Humor is always a tool of the oppressed. What makes Larry David's humor uncomfortable is he's a man of privilege who feels oppressed by everybody. But my favorite joke, which is historic and happens to be something that actually occurred, is a young uh, Jewish boy is asked in the Warsaw Ghetto, what would you like to be most of all if you were Hitler's son? And he said, and Yiddish is profound in that, I want to be an orphan. <laughs> and, and part of what he's doing is he's killing Hitler in his imagination. Yeah. So what Mel Brooks is doing is going like this to Hitler in his imagination um, and, and sort of uh, scorning him. So it gives him a moment of power over it. And remember in the sixties was also the porn broker mm -hmm. and the porn broker dealt with two things. It dealt with, with um, the combination of the survivors damaged goods, but also the horrific images of what we were doing in Harlem in the breakdown of urban life in Harlem uh, which was characteristic of the 60s. The 60s, this was a precursor to the riots. Remember this occurred in 1965, right? In 65, it was a precursor to the riots, but anybody who lived there understood the disintegration of neighborhoods. The other thing about the producers, which is incredible, is you have the way in which memory comes. Memory does not come in complete scenes very often. When you're fighting memory, it comes in flashes. So he's on a train, he sees flashes between the reality of the train and the train he was once on. Somebody brings a ring to him and then he sees a scene in which the rings of the women are being removed. Uh, he sees a prostitute and he thinks of the way in which the, the Jewish women were made into um, uh, what the, um, what the, um, uh, what Germans. were called, uh, um, you know, um, uh, were, were made into, into prostitutes, but they were called something different. They were called, um, 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 I'm trying to remember the name uh, and the like. The same thing happened in the rape of Nanjing. Comfort women, I'm sorry, was the, comfort women was the word that was used. Mm -hmm. And even e e to provide for the Nazis, they even, uh, allowed the violation of race law to provide these quotation marks, comfort women, meaning the sexual violation. Gotcha. 
let's let's come if we can to the 70s i want to throw out some films and a tv miniseries that i think changed the world in a certain way and pick what sort of rings a bell for you if you can uh the day the clown died the infamous jerry lewis movie that was never released jacob the liar i don't know if you ever saw it's a wonderful east german film uh, the Man in the Glass Booth, Maximilian Schell, written by Robert Shaw, the villain in the James Bond movie. Uh, Julia, Fred Zinnemann, um, Holocaust, you know, Noam Chomsky, the, the miniseries, um, and The House on Garibaldi Street. So let me let, let's let's touch on a, a couple of those. First of all, the docudrama, The Holocaust. Um, Essentially, that occurred, that was the transitional moment in the consciousness of the Holocaust. Um, and um, not only in the United States, but in Germany as well. We just did a documentary on the impact of the docudrama of the Holocaust in Germany. And I got to repeat my nasty line about that, which is the docudrama had more impact than the original. <laughs> right. It certainly uh, did, boy. It it it, it but brought it in for, for America. For America, that was the moment when the bereaved memories of a parochial community went to center stage. It yeah. came a year after Roots, which meant all of a sudden America was interested in the stories of segments of the community, the backstory. Uh, it came after Roots, and its impact reverberated. Its first impact was on survivors. Everybody all of a sudden wanted to listen to their story, hear what they had to say. Within a, within a month after the end of the docudrama, the President uh, Carter announced the creation of the President's Commission on the Holocaust that ultimately led to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. So there's a proximity and an impact. It led to Yale beginning uh, the what is now the Fortune of Archive of Video Testimony. It meant all of a sudden that Holocaust classes were filled after being, you know, three students, five students, and the like. It brought of age Holocaust scholarship. It brought of consciousness Holocaust literature. Had massive impact. Why? Because it was told as one whole narrative in which the Weiss family experienced every dimension of the events. They seem to have been everywhere and done everything. But the other part of it is that, that the Weiss family was not an alien family. They were a family that most Americans could identify with, an assimilated family, uh, much like, quotation marks, you and me, the average main, main uh, American uh, family had tremendous impact. Uh, Elie Wiesel uh, essentially thought it was a violation, uh, an aesthetic violation, an atrocity uh, and the like, but he, had, um, he didn't understand the fact that, that in order not to be an elite presentation, but to be a Hollywood presentation, you have to go um, it's the Hollywood was about at that point the common person, and remember we also had a unifying television. Everybody saw the Holocaust, mm -hmm. meaning meaning that there were three channels, and the joke in New York City was that water pressure went down during intermission <laughs> because people used that to either get a glass of water or go to the bathroom. Yeah. And water pressure became dangerously low as everybody was, was using it. And it really had massive, massive impact. Look, the man in the glass booth was clearly in relationship to what happened earlier in the generation, which was um, um, uh, the Eichmann trial and the question of who is the guilty one and, 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 and the like. So all of the... And, and, the very interesting thing of Jacob the Liar raises a very, and I, I saw both the East German version and the- um, Robin American, Williams. American version with Robin Williams. Yeah. Raises the question about the promise of hope and the danger of hope. And what do you offer people? 
Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's, it's a man who uh, essentially overhears a report um, on a radio that the Russians are advancing, which gives the people hope, and then begins to lie to the people as everybody's interested in it, and offers them reports that are, <laughs> what, uplifting and strengthening and morally compelling and everything that there is hope at the end of it all. And the final scene, which is anti-Hollywood, is there's the deportation and they all die. They're all murdered. But the most important part of that is to raise the question, when do you level and when do you tell, and what's the danger of the truth? And um, uh, let me just add to that, Michael, one of my favorite phrases in understanding the Holocaust is a paradox. The great Walter LeCur once said, um, the optimist uh, died, the pessimist left. <laughs> Boy, meaning, how prophetic, meaning, right? Meaning, when do you not have, when do you not have, when do you realize the situation is hopeless, you get your rear end out of there, even out of the ghetto, even out of what, into the forest, out of Germany, etc. And the other thing he said about rescue is that the, um, the pessimists won and the optimists weren't even given a hearing, which is those who said nothing could be done essentially uh, doomed it. Let me ask you one quick aside and then we'll move on. I know the clock is ticking on us, but it's about Julia, the film Julia. Um, you know, the Lillian Hellman piece, Pentimento, about her friend Julia. Uh, with Jane Fonda and Vanessa Redgrave, uh, who plays Julia. Um, any thoughts on, you know, a woman who in, in her personal life, in her real life, spoke out against Zionism, against Israel, against a lot of things. And I remember her getting booed at the Academy Awards and the fact that she's an actress playing a particular role. There's one crossover. Remember that she also later played uh, playing for time. Yes. <laughs> and remember also that Jane Fonda at that point, for some in the American population, was uh, Jane Fonda of Vietnam. Han Hanoi Jane, yeah. Han Hanoi, Hanoi Jane. Yeah. So, um, and the Jewish community, uh, we haven't touched on one thing, which is the Jewish community um, was very sensitive to when non-Jews played this. Mm -hmm. And also to whether there are political criteria for playing certain things or whether an actor is merely an actor or also a human being who has a politics all their own. Um, and it had levels of trust and distrust when it was put into the hands of non-Jews. Now, when I worked with Elie Wiesel many years ago, I said, you know, you made that decision knowingly or unknowingly the moment you published Night in French and not in Yiddish which is that in a world of artistic freedom, if you put your work out, it's gonna be used of people by lesser and greater talents, lesser and greater sensitivities. And we haven't gone into all the schlock movies right. uh, of the Holocaust and those who use it. And they're, they're, you could even say there's sometimes the possibility of quotation marks, Holocaust porn Mm -hmm. or people who just use it for the violence and, and the like, but that's not our subject today. But Jewish community uh, wants everybody to have the sensitivity of a great artist, the mastery of Spielberg and, uh, and you know, the emotional discipline to deal with this. And the moment you put it out there, uh, not everybody can do that and most people can't. Uh, Michael, let's take a couple more questions from you and then touch some from the audience. We are I wanna... We're certainly not going to get through the 80s, 90s, and the 21st century at this True. Stage. I, I want to put two movies out you to you. And... Go, you and I, we know each other well. We can go on forever, <laughs> and it's always interesting between us. We, we could end on Thursday morning. I, I want to put two movies out to you. One is from the, the 80s and one is from the 90s. One is Sophie's Choice and two is Schindler's List. And then we can certainly open up to some questions. So let me, let's take Sophie's Choice first. Let me, uh, Sophie's Choice again, let's take a look at, um, I was very close to Bill Styron. 
And the most interesting thing is the difference between the novel and the film. Uh, at the pivotal moment in the novel, Bill Styron steps back and he asks the question, what manner of man can ask a woman to give up one of her children? And then goes into a whole theory of slavery and does it because for him that was the that was his link. Part of why he had Stingo as the narrator is he was the southern boy who has experienced this all in the history of slavery. And again, we can go in, but we won't go into the difference between slavery and and um, and the Holocaust. In slavery, the slave was capital investment. In the Holocaust, the Jews were dispensable and were consumable raw material. In the film. At that pivotal moment, very few words are used. And you see it all in Meryl Streep's face. Arguably, or maybe unarguably, the greatest actress of this generation. And she learned, in order to play that role, she learned Polish and German. She spent six months learning both languages in order to perform a very few lines in both languages. Uh, and again, some, my friend Richard Brownstein will say it's not a Holocaust film because it doesn't deal with a Jew at the center. It certainly deals with a survivor, but this case a non-Jewish survivor and deals with Brooklyn, the Brooklyn you know, the Brooklyn I know of, of the post-war period, earlier than, than probably we remember it, but it's still the same ethos. And again, the, the, the Jew is in um, the deranged situation, but he's not a survivor and Sophie is in that. Um, had tremendous impact. The novel is, is a great novel because Styron is a masterful uh, writer. Uh, and let's touch on Schindler's List by saying... Uh, wait, wait, before you do, I want to ask you what, if you would repeat some one thing. I, I remember you and I had this conversation about Sophie, and I asked you a question, and I'm still struck by the answer. I said to you, what kind of human being, what kind of man makes another human being make that choice? You know, in other words, who were these, the, quote, master race? Well, do you remember your answer to me? No, but you do. <laughs> you said because he could. Yeah. That's the ultimate answer. I, They're all, they, they, they are for a moment all powerful and he wanted to break her. And he could break her. And let me just say the audience to our, to our, our people with us, Hannah Arendt made a terrible mistake when she wrote The Banality of Evil. It's the banality of the evil doer. The evil will. The evil was ultimate. It was obs obscene. It was extremist. It was anything but ordinary. The people who performed it all of a sudden had this omnipotence, and they could do what they wanted to do. Yeah, it's sort of mind-boggling, you know, to try and understand who these people are. Let Let's come to Schindler. I want to just give you an introduction because. You know, I, I think, and I think you do too, it's one of the greatest movies ever made. It's, a, it's an incredible document in, in cinematic history about something. Claude Landsman, who did show of the nine hour, you know, film said, it's kitschy melodrama. It's the defamation of the truth. Stanley Kubrick said, and this is sort of reflects on something you said before. He said, the film is about success. Holocaust movies are about 6 million people who got killed. This is about 600 who didn't. How do you address that? And let's just talk a little Schindler. Well, clearly Spielberg chose an odd hero. His hero was a Nazi. His hero was a war profiteer. His hero was a man who uh, betrayed everyone and everything, who slept around and, and all of that. Uh, but you know, um, in the Holocaust, Yad Vashem made a, a, a historical mistake by calling the rescuers righteous among the nations of the earth. Ordinary people at 
pivotal moments did extraordinary things. Yeah. And it's ordinary decency that won the day at that point. And to Spielberg's credit, I don't think he gave Schindler a, um, a transformative moment. The audience could debate what was the moment at which Schindler changed his thing, changed his, his stripes. And the other thing about the film that I find, the only false note in the film that I find is I don't think Spielberg could end it. And that is that he has four endings. Any one of the four endings would have been terrific. The, um, the survivors visiting Schindler's grave, the juxtaposition of the characters and the real people, the um, notion that, that there were uh, 12,000 survivors of Schindler and there are only 5,000 uh, Jews in Poland. All of those are, and Schindler's himself, his departure uh, and whoever saves the world saves the world entire. Uh, all of those could have been endings, but Spielberg somehow couldn't walk away from it. Right. Now, one of our audience asked about profiting from this. I have found very few artists, very few filmmakers, and I work with many, who really want to profit from the Holocaust. They, they often want to do their best work. Spielberg himself never believed he would make money from Schindler's List. He gave all of the money he made from Schindler's List, which is the highest grossing Holocaust film ever. He gave all of that money to charity, gave it, um, used that to finance the Shoah Foundation. Uh, to, to be honest with the audience, I was president for that foundation for two and a half years. So he gave that money away because, A, you know, thankfully he didn't need it. But B, he didn't want to profit from it. But I've worked with many filmmakers who really want to do a work that is equal to the, that it can't be equal to the event, but is the best their talent can do to portray the event. And that's in one sense why Spielberg did it. He also, remember, used black and white. So he threw away the tool of beautifying. And, and you and I, um, and most of our audience originally experienced the Holocaust in black and white with the images of black and white. And the other part of it, he, raised, he, he, he pushed for authenticity even in, in where he used it. He also tried not to use the tools. He didn't use cranes. He didn't use a, a, a range of things in order to get to a versatility to a, a sense of truthfulness, right? Um, and and that's part that's part of of, of what he did. Let's um, turn in in the in the brief moment we have um, uh, a um, uh, to some of the questions. Um, One woman says, when I saw Schindler's List, I remember the audience stood at the end and applauded. I remember the silence of the audience. And let me tell one story too. Um, I also saw the premiere of Schindler's List in, uh, not the premiere, I saw a showing of Schindler's List in Germany. And I did something that I've only done twice in my life, which is I sat in the front of the audience and didn't look at the screen, but looked at the audience. And it was dramatic to see the difference between the younger generation in Germany responding to it and the older generation. It was also dramatic to see at what moments they felt most uncomfortable because they were German. I saw it in Berlin. The only other time I ever did that was I saw um, um, Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. I was writing on it and I went to see it twice, once to see the film and the second time to see the audience seeing the film. And when I go through museums, I very often see um, the museum and then see the audience responding to the museum. But it's the only time I ever did it with film. And it was remarkable, its power in Germany itself. And it portrayed a, a decent German which made it also um, also um, uh, very important. You know, 
first of all, it's interesting, the Q&A, they want a part two because we have about several other decades. Two things about Schindler that, that struck me. One of them is I think Rafe Fiennes, that was to me the greatest performance about evil I've ever seen, about how compelling it is. You know, it's easy for us to sort of dismiss it, but there's something about that that was incredibly powerful. The other thing is, you know, when, when we do movies on festivals, and I always ask people to sit through the credits, when Schindler was over, one of the things that struck me was how people raced out of the theater because they only wanted to beat the traffic home. You know, it's, it's almost as if they couldn't let that movie settle. It's so powerful. It, it brings up so much that, you know, it's almost like you have to run away from it. You have to run out the door. Well, let's also say this and, and link it to something else. Um, Lanzmann himself, when he made Shoah, essentially said, screw the audience. He made it nine and a half hours. Mm -hmm. He did no shortcuts, meaning that even though you had subtitles, he made the audience experience the translation for, as he heard it and do it. And essentially said, if you want to go to the Holocaust, if you want to get to the Holocaust, you're going to give me this time. And you're going to, and anybody who saw that film, especially for the first time, I've now seen it multiple times, is emotionally exhausted at the end. Spielberg himself made it for all of this time, three hours and what, 15 minutes and the like, and essentially said, and, and remember the theaters were unhappy with that because then they only had one showing. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, he violated the rules on that, but sort of going to see this film, you're going to see this film on my terms. Right. And, and um, there's a certain sense of both confidence and it's worthy. It's got to be seen. You got to go through it um, at, 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 great, um, at great length and not take shortcuts. You know, one other thing about the Shoah, you talk about remembering, you know, fragments of memory. Here's one memory I have from the nine and a half hours. During one of the trials, a woman testified and she got up from the stand and she walked across and she turned and she looked at the German high command, old men in suits. When we think of, if you think of films, uh, you know, about Germany, uh, you know, it's, it's Lenny Reifenstahl, it's 3 million people, it's everyone is bigger than life in those uniforms. And, and her look, which is, this is the master race? This is the race that ruled the world? You know, it's a great moment of silence. Um, well, you know, we, 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 uh, we're going to conclude this, this way, Michael, because um, um, time rules. <laughs> yes, I get su gonna get As su Suzanne. <laughs> gonna get su Suzanne back, but um, look at Hitler, look at Himmler, and then contrast it uh, with the portrayal I did the film on on uh, on conspiracy with uh, Heid with oh, right. Kenneth Branagh. Kenneth playing. Branagh will always Heidrich. be uh... Heidrich. Heidrich was the Nazi who looked like a Nazi. That's right. And At Kenneth Branagh did. Kenneth Brano right. was that. But again, um, uh, people deceive themselves and are deceived by what they see. And that's also a lesson for our day. Suzanne, we're going to have to turn it back to you uh, reluctantly because Michael and I could go on. We were just getting warmed up. <laughs> I, I know. I know. This conversation is fantastic. And I'm sorry that uh, we haven't been able to get to all of it. And, and as people have suggesting, uh, maybe we can schedule a time for a part two in the future. I know there's a lot of areas uh, that we could still delve into. Uh, thank you both so much. Really, really appreciate it. I wanted to let everybody know that we will send a follow-up email email that will include a link to the recording, as well as I guess you can call it Michael's, uh, Michael Berlin's syllabus uh, that he created with uh, all of the films by the decade. Um, I know everybody has a lot of films uh, that they're going to want to watch um, in the coming months. Um, so we will include that and I'll include all of the uh, films we even didn't get to discuss today. Uh, I just wanted to remind everybody to go to momentmag.com where you can find uh, movie reviews by our film critic, Dean 
Christina Gold, uh, as well as sign up for next week's Zoominar about Jewish art and architecture. We thank everybody for coming. And again, Michael Berenbaum, Michael Berlin, thank you very much. And Shana Tova, everybody. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Thanks, Michael.